song you never heard of. Hey everybody, welcome to the Common Folk Podcast with Ben, Morgan, and Andy. Welcome back to the Common Folk Podcast. Yes, sir. Here we are. Morgan, how are you doing today? Doing good. Yeah? Doing good. You guys are both in some Husker gear, Ben. We should have... I see this. We missed the memo. Yeah. It's like Team Red versus Team Black here. Yeah. On the, what the heck? Sorry about that. Depending on what side <laughs> of the table you are on or podcasting. How was your uh, morning since you're still on early mornings? Oh, you know, it rolls around pretty early, but I guess I'm getting used to it now. Uh, but yeah, I got up about a quarter till four. Got on the road. Got to the radio station. Yep, got to the radio station. So, yep. Any any crazy people calling in, saying anything? Uh, no. I, I got this crazy guy that does the livestock opening markets. Um, well, it's out of Beatrice. It's their livestock market, and they got a big mm. sale every Monday. So he calls oh. in and just gives that five-minute rundown. And we got feeder hogs. We got, you know, he, I just say, here's Denny, go. And he just talks for five minutes straight. Like I space out, you know, about did 30 you, seconds into it. <laughs> did you stay up late last night with the Super Bowl? Oh, heck yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. So then you had to get up at four. Mm-hmm. Oh. That yeah. sucks. So it did. But uh, uh, no, I, I drank a glass of water before I went to bed. But mm. that still Just doesn't. one. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't erase the four or five IPAs <laughs> during the game. <laughs> Minimum. Yeah. Yeah. So. Minimum. Didn't, didn't the Super Bowl used to be later? I feel like we got done. Mm-hmm. Is that the dog? Yeah. Millie, come Millie, on now. Millie's just doing a little scratching. Uh, I feel like it was over, and we were headed home earlier than ever. Yeah. Normally, I feel like it is later. Maybe right. they're getting smarter. I still wish they would do it on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. Well, and then there's this big uproar saying, well, then everybody should get Monday off of work. Yeah. yeah. And I think to combat that, like you're saying, well, they're, they're just starting kickoff an hour or two earlier. Mm-hmm. Now. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it was 5.30 for us. I guess mm-hmm. 6.30 is not too bad, Eastern. Yeah, but- yeah. I just think there's too much tradition, and we're going to talk about tradition and whatnot today, but yeah. with it being on Super Bowl Sunday. True. Professional football is meant for Sundays. High is school tradition. is Friday, college is Saturday. Okay, you can't yeah. do it Saturday. Don't do it Saturday. Just give everyone Monday off then anyway. No one goes into work anymore anyway, so right. what does Screw it matter? It. Yeah. <laughs> that Nobody is true. There's anymore. a lot of hungover people at their desk today. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, or at their desk from home, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> that's at home. So before we get into it, um, since our last episode, uh, we had we had Drew Jones on and hit a lot of local folks, mm-hmm. uh, Nebraska wise, and we got a lot of contact from people. Um, really liked the episode. You know, oh, cool. getting getting turned on to the uh, to the podcast, doing a few reviews. So I just want to take that opportunity to ra- remind people. Uh, if you're listening on Apple, get on there, do a review for us. There you go. Uh, review and five star. And then on uh, Spotify, you can't put a review in, but you can do the mm-hmm. the five star thing. You know, you can click on it, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, it makes a big deal. Helps us out a lot. So appreciate people doing that. And we're still sending out shirts. Morgan was printing a couple of them today. Okay. Um, people who do the reviews, let us know you did it. Send me an email or a text message or I guess a, an Instagram or Facebook message. Yeah, probably not text. At Farm Focused. <laughs> um, ben at Farm Focused, F-O-C-U-S-E-D dot com. And we'll get you a shirt, hat, headed your way, whatever the case may be. Very cool. Yeah. And I mean, we've been at this for just a little over a year now. Mm-hmm. We've got about 52, 53 episodes out there. So, um, and we're not advertising and all that sort of stuff. So the organic right. growth, yep. leaving messages. Uh, subscribing, you know, depending on what service or platform you're a part of, that really does help us out a lot mm-hmm. as far as growth. It is cool. Yeah, yeah, and it's just cool to hear from people, too. Yeah, exactly. Good, bad, ugly, let us have it. Yeah, man. <laughs> Very true. Very true. I do get a lot of hate messages about Andy. <laughs> Vol. I believe that. I don't know why, but I believe that. They're like, that guy. You call him the voice, more like the idiot. You know? <laughs> no, no, yeah. no. So no, that's all good. So let's uh, we'll have you kick this one off, Andy. We got a guest today, and and you got them lined up. So yeah. What's up? So you know, I got this uh, helping out the company, uh, hosting a morning show, a radio show on a country music station, and one of their staples that they've been doing over the years, and it's kind of a community uh, deal, is it's called the High School Quiz Bowl. And it's just a competition between all the local high schools, and it's all live, so it's all calling. It's kind of 
uh, hectic. There was a learning curve for me. Like I couldn't <laughs> even take a live call. I didn't like going live myself. Why? Uh, I'd rather just do the pre-recorded stuff. So if I trip up on my words or whatever, I can fix it. Okay. And then go back. When you're live, yeah, that's it. You know. Um, and if I were to curse or you know say the the you know f word or something, yeah, that's just a fine. Then you know, like I can't go back and erase that. That's a fine for the station. Yes, and if someone's listening from the FCC, right? Yeah. So I can't make it better. And also, I was warned by the previous guy, like. You're going to want a voice track because a lot of our guests, uh, they don't really watch their language. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I'm always thinking of that, too. So, this the Quiz Bowl, you have two high schools with, what, four-man teams? Uh, yeah, three or four. Three or yeah. four. So, you got six kids, eight kids on at a time, two teachers, a couple of in-studio guests, myself. And, and like, I'm not well-reversed in any of this. I'm figuring it out. I'm learning it. But it's still a little stressful. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But without further ado, this is Dean Schisler. Uh, he wears a number of hats, but I, I met him because he's who hosts and puts on the Quiz Bowl year in and year out for B103 uh-huh. down, down in Nebraska City. So, Dean, and, uh, how, how you long doing? have you done that? Uh, I've done that, I think, for four years now. Okay. So. Okay. Yep. And uh, let me run down the list here. Dean is the Civil War Veterans Museum uh, Memorial Hall uh, coordinator. Uh, well, yeah, a Nebraska City Museum Association coordinator, uh, and then each of the museums there in Nebraska City is, uh, are kind of under my purview. So, <laughs> And I think you got seven museums around Nebraska City and then one in Syracuse as well. So, Right. I, yeah. And one of the ones that a lot of folks may know about is the Craigel Windmill Factory. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, you know those old windmills? Yeah. A lot of them were made right here in Nebraska City, right oh. down the road. Huh. Um, and then... Most recently, a couple of days ago, uh, Super Bowl Sunday, the Nebraska City Museum of Firefighting, something you else, you, you're a big part of that, yeah. just had their uh, yearly Super Bowl, yeah. right? Yeah, that's our, <laughs> our fun play on words there. That's one of their uh, two fundraisers they do every year uh, is the, the Super Bowl Soup Luncheon, uh, obviously spelled S-O-U-P, Super Bowl. Got Super it. Because we can't use the words yeah. Super Bowl. <laughs> Yeah. You know, so uh, without putting a little copyright on there. But, um, yeah, it's one of their two fundraisers they do uh, every year, that and uh, Firehouse <laughs> Grill, which is during Applejack. They roll mm-hmm. out a big, huge barbecue smoker and make brisket, and it's awesome. So, But we had a great turnout. I think the best one we've ever had. So so yeah. it's, a fu- it's a fundraiser for the museum? Yeah, yeah. So the fire department, um, they clear all the trucks and everything out of the fire station, set up tables and like 20 or 22 crock pots full of soup and desserts and everything. And then, uh, cause it's catty corner across from the museum. So where city hall and the fire station are, if you just go straight, uh, Northeast from there is the museum. So those two fundraisers every year, um, help support all the programs and events and yeah. new exhibits and whatever we need. And I did the reader about five times a day for the last 20 days, over 20 soups and salads. And delicious desserts ready for you at the Nebraska City. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. You got uh, it. Yeah, yeah. And it worked because the turnout we had was Ooh, incredible. See? So, it's because uh, it was Andy. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was I, all radio. I think it was the homemade uh, chicken noodle soup. That did had you more go? To do. I wanted to. I really did. Okay. I had plans and uh, I just couldn't get everyone on the yes. same page to get down there, then make it to where we were supposed to be for the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. As well, so gotcha. so the um, the museum. What's the what's the idea behind that? Well, the uh, the museum kind of started as just a collection of stuff that one of the firefighters had saved for literal decades. He started in the early '40s, I think, just going back to all their storage facilities, and it's like, hey, we have old trucks and hose carts and buckets mm-hmm. and uniforms, and he put them all in a Kwanzaa hut. And kind of nobody knew for a really long time. So every time they'd get rid of something, he'd go grab it. And when they finally figured that out uh, in the 90s, there was a plan to make a museum out of it. And uh, I think it wasn't until 2007, I believe, 2006, 7, hmm. they got that museum built. Um, and Nebraska City has the oldest fire department in the state. And so it's kind of a, a celebration of that uh, and the history of that department and then just the history of firefighting in general. Uh, and then we do like, <clears throat> excuse me, kids events, um, 
for like uh, fire prevention, safety, and things like that. So we cover a ton of topics. Interesting. Huh. But we have, yeah, everything in there from like old leather buckets from the bucket brigades to, uh, you know, more modern things. There's um, a 1926 and 1936 uh, fire trucks that are in there. Uh, there's a big, wow. big white cab off a fire truck that kids can get in and hit like the sirens and lights and whatever. And so little uniforms. So we took bunker gear that was old cut it up into pieces and made little tiny versions of bunker <laughs> gear jackets. So, nice. <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty, the kids love it and, uh, we get school groups every year. And so it's a, a pretty good place. And, but in order to keep doing that, we got to have our fun fundraisers like selling soup and brisket. Sure. So. Yep. You know, I bet the kids really love that and you do a good job of gearing it towards some of the educational stuff. But I bet there's some good old boys that were part of a volunteer fire department or part of the department from Chicago, Omaha, whatever. They come and see that, and they can't get enough of it. Yeah, it's actually one of my favorite things that's in there that kind of people just walk by and don't notice is the patch wall. So anytime we have somebody come from a, another fire department, mm -hmm. they bring us a patch. Oh. And so we've got – they're about um, you know, three foot by six foot big felt panels uh, with plexiglass over them. And I think there's three of them now in there mm. that are completely filled with patches from – just oh, all over, all over yeah. the world. Actually, that's I think super there's, cool. There's one from Poland, one from Germany, uh, one from Australia. Uh, I think we've got six or seven from uh, different battalions in the uh, New York Fire Department. Because uh, we also have a display out front that's a piece of the World Trade Center. Oh wow! So we've got a chunk of steel out there from from that. And so when they brought that to us, there was a whole ceremony of mm. setting that up, and then. Mm -hmm. um, they gave us patches from the different engine and ladder companies that were cool. involved. So that's well, a pretty cool I, thing. You know, you know, that's something that I, you know, I didn't know existed. Mm -hmm. I, I knew of the, uh, the one and I did a, a news blip on it, uh, a little feature story about the, uh, museum out in Kearney. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I suppose you guys work with them and trade pieces back and forth maybe here and there or not really? Uh, not really. Um, I know that my predecessor, uh, in this job, worked with them a little bit when they mm -hmm. were first setting okay. up things because uh, I only recently went through there the first time uh, back in October mm -hmm. of last year. So uh, going through there and looking at their exhibit panels and how they're set up and how they're designed, I'm like, I know who did those. Okay. <laughs> because they're, they're very similar in like structure and style to all yeah. the ones we have. You can tell. Um, yeah. And it's just like one little section that I think he helped them out on. But they came to us for um, photos and video and stuff that they use in that museum. Yeah. Um, that they wanted like the actual original negatives and stuff. Cause mm. we also have all of that from the, the fire department right. as well as like big, uh, folders full of photos and a bunch of news footage from old fires and things. So when that one gets a lot of traction because it's, you know, in a bigger town in Kearney and it's along mm -hmm. I 80 and right. I believe fire school is there, you know, throughout the year, mm -hmm. you know, for yep. different departments and, yep. Uh, and they're edu continuing it or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever that's called. Then you'd know more about that than I do. Yeah, it's a big kind of hub area for mm -hmm. Nebraska and and kind of Midwest firefighting to go down for training and stuff like that. Yeah, I know. I know we send uh, guys from the department there in Nebraska City go out there mm -hmm. at least once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. So, yep. But. Yeah, it's a, and that's interesting too. Like you said, um, that Nebraska was one of the first, if or Nebraska City was one of the first, if not the first. Fire department in the state? Uh, the first, if you count the like the original bucket brigades. Uh -huh. um, that's kind of why the department is structured the way that it is right now, too, um, which is, I mean, it's not unique, but most departments aren't this way. There's three separate companies within Nebraska City Volunteer mm -hmm. Fire Department. <clears throat> you have uh, Great Western Fire Company, Odo Hook and Ladder, and Company Number One. Each of those three were original Bucket Brigade fire companies back in uh, 1857, mm. 58. Oh. So, uh, and actually, you mentioned the the Windmill Factory Museum. Uh, George Craigle of yeah. of the Craigle Factory is uh, in one of the original pictures from the Great Western Fire Company um, when they had these uniforms that we call the Annie Oakley uniforms. Okay, they, they had like fringe and whatever. It hmm. just it's the style they chose. Um, but he's in one of those. He helped start the Great Western Fire Company. So we have the main department, and then it's divided into the three different companies. So interesting. Yeah, and yeah, in, in Nebraska City, because it is one of the oldest cities in the state of Nebraska, does have a lot of 
tradition and, and just it was the first. So mm-hmm. and the fact that you're preserving that and still telling the story, I think is pretty cool, pretty amazing. And it, it was just kind of wild. I was listening to a sports podcast, you know, over sports betting. Mm-hmm. And this guy just went off and was like, oh, if you don't have anything to do on a day, my wife and I, we went down to Nebraska City and we went to the Craigle Windmill. Like, no kidding. I'm like, what? what? <laughs> and they talked like a half an hour about how cool that was. And mm-hmm. now I want to go. <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, it's an interesting place. I would say it's pretty niche. Mm-hmm. That's um, There's a lot of people that kind of stumble across it. Yeah. Coming into town. That's, what, that's their story. Yeah. Not many people that come to town specifically for mm-hmm. the windmill factory, although – we have had people that do that before, but um, windmill enthusiasts are very singly minded people. <laughs> like, okay. They're all oh. about windmills. It's okay. like if you've ever met a railroad guy. Like, oh, yeah. Yep. Railroad. It's only railroad all the time. <laughs> and windmillers are the exact same way. Uh, and for what that factory is, uh, it's a 1903 windmill factory. That is the last intact historic windmill factory in the country. Um, so you're like, where else are you going to see that? Nowhere. Right. right. Yeah. And so people show up thinking it's a windmill museum and they expect to see a ton of windmills. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh. no, factory. Like it's where this... they made it. We have one uh, right across the street in the city hall parking lot. There's a big 36 mm-hmm. foot um, all steel Eli windmill. That was their brand they made, ELI. Um, and so we've got one there, but a lot of people that show up don't even notice that it's there, which right. is really funny. <laughs> Because they'll call us and say, like, well, we're, we can't find it. Where is it? Well, we're across the street from the giant windmill. And then they eventually find the building and come in and go, like, <laughs> well, we found the building, but we didn't find the windmill. And you're, like, point across the street. And you're like, that one? <laughs> like, that, <laughs> that gigantic steel oh, windmill? Oh, yeah, there yeah. it is. Look so up. are people so. disappointed when they want to see windmills and you said it's just a factory? I mean, yes and no. Okay. Um, some We've had a very few amount of people come in that are, are kind of – you know, like, they were expecting one thing yeah. and got another thing. Gotcha. Um, but usually by the time they're part of the way through the tour, their mind has changed. So it's like an organized sense. tour or um, do they just go through themselves? Like if we came down, what we, does that look like? We can do both. I gotcha. So there's an attendant there all the time when they're open that can do uh, a guided tour. But, okay. <clears throat> excuse me. The way it's set up um, is kind of they, they took the, the factory as it sat with literally everything just left as if they just went to lunch and never came back. And then we oh. cleared out a space to put in a like big U-shaped walkway that goes through the middle of the factory. And along that walkway are little video kiosks that you can hit. And it shows like, here's how a, a lathe works or a, a hole punch or whatever. Uh-huh. Um, and then there's little buttons you can hit that'll light up that specific piece of machinery. Uh, or we can do a guided tour, which usually takes quite a bit longer than does it just okay, walking yeah. through with the videos yeah. uh, probably an hour hour and a half so uh, i have had people in there for like four or five hours before so that's, whoa that's interesting because that, yeah. that's actually where i started I windmill people that, Andy. I bet. yeah uh, those are the people that's where i started okay. uh, as an intern when i was still in college oh wow um, i was an intern there and then i was a interim executive director um, randomly when our executive director left, mm-hmm. uh, and that was a trial by fire. Uh, and then I was assistant director for another, I think it was a total of like four, four and a half years. Okay. Uh, so before I, I took off my, took over my current position. So I think that's a good lead in to what I've been wondering as you're talking here the whole time, how do you even get into this? Like <laughs> how many people do you know? Like, do you know Andy or Morgan right. that are as involved in museums and, and this kind of thing that you're involved in. I, I know nobody. I know Dean. Yeah. 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 I just met right. Dean. Yeah, I just met Dean. <laughs> so how, do, how does this happen? Like, how do you come up and, 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 I don't know, get presented with this? Or maybe you were into it beforehand? Or what, what's the story? I, I mean, the, the short answer is uh, luck. Just serendipity, I mm-hmm. guess. I mean, um, I was at Peru State College. That's uh, where I went. I graduated from Syracuse. went to Peru. Um and I was doing secondary ed social science, um, doing high school history. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was an internship that became available at the Craig Windmill Factory Museum. And my advisor down at Peru said, hey, you should go check this out. It might be interesting. So I started working there uh, while doing my 20-hour student teaching practicum. I got done with a 20-hour practicum and realized that I did not want to teach high school history. <laughs> mm-hmm. oh, <yeah. laughs> or, or rather, no one would want me teaching high school history. Well, uh, mm-hmm. I could do it. I wouldn't like it. Uh, college, I could do. 
Um, you could, but you obviously dug history. Yeah, I mean that was that was the thing though is that I guess I didn't realize at the time you can do other things with a history mm-hmm. degree mm-hmm. than teach history, um, and public history just wasn't really an option. And public history is kind of a a broad term that refers to like museums, libraries, archives, uh, that kind of thing. And I didn't realize that was an option. So I got, um, the internship ended and they kept me on full time and I changed my major, uh, Peru and dropped the teaching certificate and just went with uh, social science and poli sci and started working at the, the Craigle museum. Uh, and like I said, it was kind of a trial by fire because, um, my executive director left two weeks before Applejack in 2014, which I don't know if you've ever been to the Applejack Festival there in town. but It's crazy. But yeah. taking over a museum on Central Avenue, like <laughs> right there on the parade route, uh, two weeks before a festival where there's 100,000 people in town for a weekend was interesting. Um, <laughs> and it's... I made it, I made it through, uh, you know, as, as my grandpa would have said, like I survived, but I'll never be pretty again. <laughs> you know, like, like it was, it was fun. And looking back on it, I'd have fond memories, but man, it was, I said a trial by fire. Um, so yeah, it just kind of happened that way. And then, um, Brian Volkmer, who was the director of the museum association before me, uh, was retiring, uh, in 2017 and I was on the board um, for the museum association and just went to one meeting and resigned and handed him my resume. and was like, here, throw my hat in the ring and we'll see what happens. And that just, it just happened. So wow, I got, I got lucky, but um, I, I mean, Brian had a master's in museum studies. Uh, I kind of wish that I had been able to get, you know, like a certificate in museum studies. Um, but doing it all hands on in the five years that I've had this job, I think I've learned just as much as I could mm-hmm. doing that. So, um, yeah, I think yeah. that's a really important point that I think a lot of people need to understand. You know, you're going to college, and college is important. Um, you know, for for certain people in certain situations, but a lot of times, what you get out of that even more is you get into those internships, you get into those jobs that you can start applying whatever it is that you're learning in college. Because if you, if you think you're just going to go to school uh, for four years and not have a job, not have a connection somewhere, not Mm -hmm. have some kind of thing that you can tie the two to, Mm -hmm. and then get out of school and, oh, all right, now it's time for me to get a job and get going. That ain't the way it works. Yeah. No. And the internships, and this happens with so many students, is what ends up leading you down a road or down a path that you start realizing. Yep. Oh crap, man! I really like this. This is okay. Now I know where I want to go with this. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it it really isn't what you know; it's who you know, right? Um, and when when your advisor in college tells you you need to have some extracurricular things and go out and do like career networking and whatever, yeah, you you really do. Yeah, <laughs> you listen, really need to right? do that. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it just you know, college is very important for a base understanding of a lot of things. Uh, especially in the history field, but you know, unless you're going to go teach college, a PhD is a ridiculous thing to have, especially yeah. like in public history. I don't think you can actually get a PhD in public history. Hmm. As far as I know, you can get a master's. Um, I was working on my master's out at UNK. Um, I got put on hold for 2020 when that happened. Oh, so geez. yeah, <laughs> uh, I got through all of my uh, general eds and was doing my thesis and then I need to get back to that at some point. So, uh, but a master's was kind of always my goal, but moving on to a doctorate, I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense. And you can learn so much from, like you said, like an infield on hand internship. Uh, so yeah, if you ever have an opportunity to do that do that, I will say the museum field and specifically like public history field, if you're going for an internship, don't do an unpaid internship because if no one applies for unpaid internships, hopefully at some point those institutions will stop doing them. Hmm. So I just, there's been a a movement uh, in the museum field in the past like 10 years to try and get rid of unpaid internships because it makes no sense. Um, You know, the only reason I took the internship at Craigle is because it was paid uh, because you can't fill a gas tank with experience. 
that doesn't work. You can't buy groceries mm-hmm. with experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and being a college kid, I was broke and I needed money. Uh, that's always a factor. Anybody that tells you that you know money is not important when you're looking for a job is lying. Mm-hmm. Of course it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why now I'm kind of on the other side of things where you know, we work with Peru State College as a museum association and we have an internship program with them. So now I get to hire interns yeah. and oh, bring great. them in for certain projects. Um, and of course they're paid <laughs> and they're paid well. Yeah. Um, that's the thing too is no, not $7 an hour, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. like we pay, uh, I think it's a $2,700 stipend oh, wow. uh, for an internship, which is, you know, it's 270 hours. It's about $10 an hour. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it all comes in, in one lump sum. And so most kids that are needing history internships are like, heck yeah, I can use $2,700. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, um, and so we, yeah, we've had some really good interns out of that that have gotten a, a lot of um, really big projects started or done or, or whatever. So and that's gotta be pretty cool for me, for you. You get to see it on both sides now. And that's the same with the quiz bowl. Cause you, back when you were in high school, you were mm-hmm. in the quiz bowl and now you're conducting it. Yeah. Yeah. I started, uh, I was in fifth grade, I think, started doing quiz bowl. Um, Because I I didn't move to Syracuse until uh, my sophomore year. So uh, I went to Conestoga from uh, second grade through ninth grade. So uh, my first year as a quiz bowl was uh, at Conestoga. Okay. Uh, Okay. Both in in Nahaka and in, well, outside Murray. Oh, yeah, that's right. They had that school in Nahaka. Mm -hmm. Which is now a... Nothing. So it's a studio and yeah, and a and a house. Kind of There's a guy lives there. there. Or something. Yeah. Well, it's it's actually there was a an old TV show that used to be on in Omaha called Doctor Sanguinary. Mm-hmm. Not heard of that. that. Mm-hmm. It was like a like a late Saturday night um, like B feature monster movie kind of show. They had a guy dressed up in like a white lab coat that had blood splatter all over it. And <laughs> okay. It was like we're going to show like creature from the Black Lagoon and you know the. Was it like the brain that wouldn't die? Like all those just really terrible old sci-fi movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he had that syndicated show for years. And his uh, assistant, as he passed away a few years ago, but his assistant took over and restarted the show as Son of Sanguinary. He's the one who owns that school, and that's where they film Son of Sanguinary. Oh, oh and that's still on? Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So our boy plays basketball once in a while in there in the gym because there's no. still a gym. Aren't you talking about the school? In, in Nahaka? Nahaka? Yeah. They go play up there? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not this season. They did last year. Oh. Mm-hmm. And there's not really any heat <clears throat> in there? There's. It's like one wing of the school. There's like classrooms converted into uh, like living quarters and whatever. Okay. And then there's one that's converted into a studio. Random. But yeah, last, last I knew mm-hmm. was Son of Sanguinary is and he'll put on what's the, filmed in there. The mock jacket with the blood all over yeah. it. So what channel <laughs> is this on and what time? God, I don't it's remember. So I know it's available to stream. Uh, last I knew, like on their website and stuff, oh, you can go watch crazy. episodes of it. But well, no, uh, if you've to. ever yeah. watched the show or remember it, Mystery Science Theater 3000. <laughs> if you've ever heard of that no. show. Oh, man. There's a spoof on Netflix God. of that right now. I know that. I know it's well, a it's spoof. Well, it's yeah. the new season. Oh, is that what? Yeah, the, the MST3K, The Gauntlet, <laughs> okay. is what's on Netflix, which is what the, a oh. remake from the original show. But God, I, I love that so much. There's 179 episodes. Wow. I've seen Holy every single one. What? Okay. Um, but they watch like old crappy movies and it's a guy and two robots and you see them in silhouette on the bottom of the screen and okay. they make fun of the movie the entire time. It, then that's that's like, the whole point of the show and it, it's Brilliant. That comedian <laughs> Patton Oswalt, right? He's one of the guys. Uh, he's one of the new, yeah, the new cast. Um, yeah. Originally, it was a guy named Joel Hodgson, uh, and then Mike Nelson was the second host. Uh, and then, yeah, Kevin Murphy and Bill Corbett were the guys that did the two That's robots. Hilarious. Tom Tom Servo and Crow T. Robot. <laughs> oh, yeah. wow. Just right down the street. Oh, man, I love, <laughs> love Mystery Science Theater. Are you trying um, to look something up over there? Yeah, I was trying to find some of it. I don't know. I can't. Like, I think it, our minds are a little bit blown. There but we go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yep, now I'm ready. And those uh, those original guys, the original three um, that were part of the, I think it ran from like 88 through 99 uh, up in Minneapolis. But those original three now do something called Rift Tracks, which is uh, like they obviously can't get the rights for modern movies. So they can't show them. Like right. those, The reason they chose crappy old B monster movies is because the rights for those cost nothing. Oh. You know, it's just, and yeah. they can re-air them, you know, along with them being on screen. But Rift Tracks, they record the audio 
and then sell the audio tracks and then you play them over a modern movie. So they've done like the entire Harry Potter run, all the Star mm. Wars films. Uh, they did Twilight. And figured out a that way around That was hilarious. Um, yeah, so it's it's the same kind of show, but it's just their voiceover oh. making jokes about what's on screen. I'll and have to watch the Twilight. Brilliant. There's huh. some, yeah. There's some holes in that storyline that could be pretty yeah. funny to uh, <laughs> yeah. explore there. So, yeah. I mean, you're such a history buff and it obviously matters a lot to you. You have a couple of sayings that, you know, Jenny's told me about, Tahowski, we've had her on oh, the yeah. show. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them is that history repeats itself. And another one that caught my ear, and I, I wish I would have wrote it down, but it's about how, and we kind of talked about it, how people are trying to alter history or rewrite history. And that's not for us to do. We need to study it and learn from history, not not try and just portray it in a way that's suitable or uh, fits one's palette of modern times. And I feel like there's a lot of that going around yeah, right now. Totally. Yeah, and it's um, – I've come across so many different instances of that just in the the job – both jobs, both at the Windmill Museum and my mm-hmm. current position. But, um, yeah, I think the, the term I like is you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes quite often. Um, and I wish I could remember who that quote was from. It's not me. But uh, the other part of, of that as far as like – interpreting history in a, in a way where you're portraying all of the, the actual facts and not putting in any legend or lore or anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That that's the most important job that we have as far as museums. And in some of the research that I've done and I've written papers on uh, just myself on some historical figures in Nebraska city that are like sort of local legends, I guess. That's mm-hmm. when it becomes hard because yeah. uh, when you actually start to research some of these people, it's like they're human beings. So the gilding on that statue that people have in their mind starts to crack away mm-hmm. real fast when yeah. you discover something like, well, they actually did that. That's not good. You know? Davy Crockett <laughs> so, wasn't at the Alamo? How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I get it. Uh, one of them is a, uh, is a local uh, chiropractor there, Major Dijarnet. Okay. I've never heard of him, but uh, he did some great things. He invented sacro-occipital technique, which is still a modern school of chiropractic. Okay. Um, I interviewed a ton of chiropractors about that. There's like three main schools. It's still one of them. Um, yeah, did a lot of really cool stuff. He had a giant gun collection, it's like the largest Colt pistol collection mm-hmm. in the world. Um, wow. Which is wild. But then he also did some experiments in the 40s. Uh-oh. Uh, Uh-oh. <laughs> using, uh, you know, people that were, you know, volunteers, quote unquote. Um, but I don't think they were fully explained <laughs> as mm. to what, what they were going to do. Uh, yeah. and in talking to some of the chiropractors I, I interviewed about that, um, I think I, I used the phrase like a moral gray area. And one of the chiropractors there in Nebraska sage goes, there's nothing gray about that. That is black and white and you would lose your license so fast. Mm. Now like, your head would spin. Um, but so, there was yeah, no license at the time. You know what I mean? Like there you got to you got to have that in perspective, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like, but it he's asking questions that didn't need to be asked. Okay, okay. Oh. I was going to say, was he trying to do something, or yeah, was it he so was it, asking? Yeah, so he mm. he was trying to answer a question that you don't need to do an experiment to answer. Gotcha. It could be answered in, in an anatomy book, um, but he had a bunch of <laughs> of volunteers come in. Um, and when something's out of place in your back in chiropractic, it's called a subluxation. It just means something's not where it's supposed to be sitting. Mm-hmm. And he brought in all these people. And for a period of two years, two years, mm. he purposely caused a subluxation in their L5, which is right above your ah. uh, pelvis. It's the lowest like base part of your spine uh, because he had never seen an L5 subluxation. So he caused one and then maintained it in these people for two years. Oh, geez. Uh, Some of them were hospitalized. Uh, One of them had severe migraines and stomach problems. Uh, One of them, for the rest of his life, his right leg was three quarters of an inch longer than his left. That Hmm. kind of thing. Hmm. Ouch. Um, But the reason that that he never saw a subluxation in the L5, I didn't understand until I was interviewing chiropractors, the force it takes to cause that like if it were to just naturally occur, is like a fall from a three-story building oh. or being hit by a car. Mm. So he like yeah, unless really you, adjusted them badly. Right. Unless you know how to do it and then you can just kind of push and click and it goes out of place. But for it to naturally occur, 
you'd have a lot of other problems, you know, <laughs> right. so you wouldn't hit just by have a that. bus, you know, that's not your only problem. Um, so he didn't need to, to do that because a, it doesn't really happen. And B, you could just look at an anatomy book mm -hmm. and go like, well, if that's out of place, all this would happen. It didn't need to be done, but yeah. it was done. So, so that's what I was thinking about when you said that <clears throat> kind of playing devil's advocate, um, at the time when he was doing it, it probably wasn't necessarily illegal or was it? No, like he, it wasn't going to cost him his, uh, his license or whatever. No, not really. Um, I wouldn't say it was, it was illegal. Ill, it, moral. Immoral. Yeah. It was yeah. immoral, yeah. but not yeah. illegal. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, the other part of it too, is that he also could have done that on cadavers, uh, which if he was a medical doctor in the 1940s, that's what they would have used. Mm -hmm. But for decades, like 50, 60, 70 years, the American Medical Association, um, basically tried to destroy chiropractic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so being a doctor of chiropractic, he wasn't allowed access mm -hmm. to cadavers. That stuff, yeah. Um, which again, you don't need <laughs> a physical specimen to do that, but, um, yeah, it contributed to it. So, and I wonder if that gets, you know, whatever his findings were, obviously that was documented. And mm -hmm. if any of that gets used today, you know, if like, if someone presents with these symptoms, here's something to think about. Take a look at this spot. Right. I mean, maybe, but the only thing written up about it was what he wrote. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've read that, that paper that he wrote and he doesn't really explain what happened. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like you want to go back and like highlight, you know, a sentence in a paragraph because it's just the end of a paragraph. And it just says like two patients were hospitalized and didn't return. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Like, no, no, we, you need to elaborate. Mm -hmm. Like, what, you're you're burying the lead here. What else mm. is going on? And he never does. So, how does it so, end? He just stopped working on these people after two, two years. years yeah, and then... he just got to the end of experiment and said, like, he recorded, you know, well, these people were fine. These people, you know, you know, there's another this. side to that too, where that void was opened up <laughs> because of the the rift between the establishment, mm. you know, the medical field, and then chiropractor trying to build a niche. And if they would have worked together, you know, I, I feel like the medical field would be like, don't do that to the lower back. You, you really don't want to do that, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, but since they're not talking and we're trying to squash you or not give you any space, you know, when there's a void like that, it's going to get filled. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, and that's yeah. with a lot of different industries, a lot of different fields. And it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't fully detract from everything good that he did because outside yeah. of, outside of Nebraska City, he's known worldwide for chiropractic. Yeah, um, everyone in town remembers him for like his patents and his things he invented and and stories like that of um, that kind of make him a local legend. But outside of Nebraska City, I mean, his um, his clients he had uh, were nationwide. Burt Reynolds was one of his clients. Hmm. Wow. Like he, he would go to Burt Reynolds yacht down in Florida and adjust and him on his that. yacht. Like wow. it's, uh, wow. I have a copy of a letter from 1937 to him, uh, where someone is asking to sell him a cult Palestinian. Uh, it's a version of a 1911 that's had like fancy, um, scales or whatever on the grips. Uh, and which would just be a normal letter if it wasn't from Adolf Hitler. Whoa. It is it is on stationery from Birch's Garden, <laughs> which was his home. If you've ever seen Band of Brothers, <laughs> the last episode of Band of Brothers uh -huh. when they're yep. up in the Eagle's Nest. Yep, love that. That's Birch's Garden. Like it's on it's stationery there. with the address and the the Reich's Eagle at the top. Oh and my god! Signature at the bottom. Like, so he was offered that because he was well known as a cult collector. Yeah, yeah, and so it was. Uh, I mean, really, it's just a, a benign letter saying like, "Hey, I have a." 1911 Palestinian, you want to buy it. That was it. But it's from Hitler, which is like, yeah. you Jeez. know, that changes the whole uh, yeah, uh, just a dynamic little. there. <laughs> but uh, that's how worldwide he was known, though. Yeah. Is that Hitler's yeah. like, oh, I got this really nice 1911. I know a guy down in Nebraska City. So <laughs> does his family still live around? Like, you know, is there no, generations? Not, no, okay. not in Nebraska City. Gotcha. Um, actually, I think his daughter just passed away a few years ago. But mm -hmm. if there's any family around, they're fairly distant uh, relatives. But uh, I know there's a guy who was working on a book about him a few years ago who called me because um, I had just got that paper done. 
And I gave a presentation at our Rotary uh, mm -hmm. about that. And then I got a, a random phone call from a, this guy writing a book. And he was asking me about where I found some of my sources and things. Um, and I never heard anything about that book. But it'd be pretty interesting, too, because I, I didn't realize until after I was on the phone with him um, that it was Ken Wheat. I don't know if you've ever heard of, of him. Mm. He's a screenwriter, uh, created Riddick. Oh. So like the whole Chronicles of Riddick yeah. universe and mm -hmm. Pitch Black. Like wow. Ken Wheat created that. And somehow he also got contracted to write a book about Dr. Dijarnet. Okay. That was weird. So I realized <laughs> yeah. that on the phone and then had <laughs> to have like a sci-fi geek moment where I'm like, oh my right. God, <laughs> like, I just want to talk to you about Riddick now. Can we do that? Yeah. You know? so shift it, gears. So. <laughs> it probably has nothing to do with each other. But when you first started talking about like some of the um, basically human testing that this guy was doing. Mm -hmm. In the back of my mind, the first thing that came was like Nazi Germany and like these weird things that were going on in some of these yeah, camps and yeah. like some of the crazy tests. And, and a lot of mm. like the scary, a lot of scary movies are set in like these weird, um, you know, labs yeah, that were in some yeah. of those camps and they're mm -hmm. doing all this crazy, crazy shit. And then you bring it around and say that Hitler contacts the guy and I'm like, <laughs> oh boy. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> what? Yeah. It's a little, uh, yeah, it brings up kind of a eugenics vibe and a, you know, yeah, um, yeah master race like selection <coughs> like, kind of thing. It's like, like uh, if they were run, if they were potentially running in kind of some of the same circles, you know, on a different on a different mm -hmm. level than what we are today, because obviously mm -hmm. today people are online and texting each other and whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But back then it would have been a whole lot harder. It would have been via mail or like understanding that someone across the, the world is doing this and someone across the world is doing that. And then mm -hmm. maybe that's somebody I want to know a little more about. Yeah, and make the perfect soldier with an unbreakable back, you know, <laughs> yeah. all that crazy stuff. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, that was a 90s yeah. movie with uh, Gene Hackman, right? Is that the Pelican Brief or what was that where Which, uh, they were trying to do experiments on homeless people to try and – they would break their back and then try and work them back up to so they could walk again. God, what was that movie? What? It was in the early 90s. Just trying to see I don't know, but when you it. keep and saying museum, I just keep thinking and Night at the Museum because oh. we like those movies. <laughs> this is a little different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know, That's but when, he was, better way when to go. he was talking about it earlier, I was like, ooh, do you like that movie? But you probably know a lot better movies than that, but – I, I also really like those movies. Do you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I also got to just say before we move on um, – the fact that if Hitler was trying to sell his gun to this guy, yeah. like to me, that's come on, man. There's plenty of people around you that you could sell that gun to. Mm -hmm. but you're going to reach across sure. the ocean and try to sell the gun to this guy. Like there's something else. They know each other. It, yeah. It, <laughs> it, just it begs a few other questions. Yeah. It yeah. doesn't quite add up. Yeah. But you're right. It, it does kind of fit with the whole, um, you know, creepy horror movie aesthetic of like a, a stark white lab and a, <laughs> yeah. you know, weird scientist with a yeah. German accent in kind some of thing. wet basement that's yeah, like, a, like uh, Dr. Mengele vibe or like Unit 731, <laughs> which is a like the Japanese version of, mm -hmm. yeah. of Dr. Mengele's lab. Um, opening yeah. scene to Pineapple Express where they're experimenting down yeah. in a basement, a wet mm -hmm. basement on with mm -hmm. marijuana, and mm -hmm. yeah, the <laughs> jeez, yeah, yeah that's yeah. wild. Yeah. Um, and of course, all those guys that were doing that over in Germany, um, we just went and got them, <laughs> you know, after yeah, the war, yeah. we we're like, Hey, you can help us build stuff too. <laughs> right. So yeah, right. it's like, we'll take you and you, yeah. you who's the best, who's Opera the best? Operation Paperclip. Yeah. That's what that was. So that's how we got to the moon. But yeah. Yeah. You're pardoned. You're pardoned. If you can get us to the moon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, I, you're a little too weird. You're not pardoned. Yeah. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you stay over there. So, yeah. I think, uh, What's really interesting is one of the things you brought up, Andy, about history in general. <clears throat> and uh, Dean, I'd be interested to, to hear a little bit more about what you think of all the different things that we're seeing today. And this is kind of what Andy was asking, but we didn't really dig into it, um, where people are like kind of trying to erase history. Like instead of just saying, let's, let's recognize what happened, let's learn from it. We don't necessarily have to celebrate it, but let's make sure it doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that are like, no, let's get rid of this. That's, you know, they're a bunch of criminals and yep. and immoral people and we don't want to talk about it anymore and all this kind of stuff. Like, I'm curious what you think about that as, would you call yourself a, a historian? Is that? I would, I mean, I would say so, or a public historian. Yeah. yeah I mean, I'd, not a, <clears throat> like a PhD, you know, mm -hmm. academic, mm -hmm. but um, studied enough that 
you know, pertains to like public history. If you're talking about like you know, public statues or mm-hmm. plaques mm-hmm. or whatever. There you go. I mean, that's right um, down that alley. And I mean, I may have a, it might be a controversial opinion. I don't think Doesn't it's controversial, matter. but, um, it's a common folk opinion. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's the, uh, the overall like way of looking at it that you see argued by a lot of people is like, well, it's being, it's being erased or it's being like, you know, deleted from the, this public space. Um, and it's not being erased because it can't be because we've written that history. We know that history. It's in books. It's like, you know, when you're in school and you're learning about this stuff, they don't take you to a statue. It's, it's in a book and someone teaches you that. Um, but a, a statue um, or a plaque or something by its very nature is a method of commemoration. Mm-hmm. It is okay to say this person, this, you know, thing that happened here is not, you know, in, it's not capable of being commemorated. We don't want to commemorate it. And like, there's a few of the statues that were taken down where it's like, yeah, yeah, that's not great. Um, the one that comes to mind is Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, uh, who is a Confederate general. Mm -hmm. There's arguments people make about Lee, about General Lee and saying like, well, he was a soldier first or whatever. He was just fighting for Virginia. Well, that's fine. He was still on the wrong side. Um, but with Nathaniel Bedford Forrest, there's no argument that can be made. I mean, he was he was a great cavalry general, sure. He was also the first Grand Wizard of the KKK. Hmm. Like, he was not a good person. Neither was right. Jefferson Davis. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's looking at it from the, the military or like the martial history side of it. And then just looking at it, it's like, you know, Lee, yes, great general. Went to West o- Point. Okay guy as far as morals go. Still a slave owner. Still, you know, that's that part of it. Um, not as bad as others. And then there's Forrest and Davis and whatever. You're like, there is no redeeming factor whatsoever mm. in any of those people. Um, and, and it's not just historical figures. It's also uh, historic sites, locations where... It's like, should we remember what happened here? Yes. But do we need to celebrate it? No. Because mm-hmm. it's written down. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not going to be ever, especially in a, in a digital world, it's not going to be completely erased. Um, mm. It's just not being celebrated. And that's, the, I feel that's like the difference. Some of those things, and I totally hear what you're saying, um, but if it's not on display, then it's just going to be in the history books. Yeah, like, like you how said. do our kids know yeah, about like, it if they're not? Yeah, if they because they're they're they may or may not get exposed to it in school. There's so many things, and if it's just tucked away in the history books, then it's gone, and that's where a lot of people want it. Like it'll just get forgotten about. It'll never get seen again. And good or bad, some of those, like you said, those those sites, those those people. Um, if it's if it's on display, then it's kind of up front and center, and, and we need to recognize mm-hmm. the good and the bad of all of it. Does that make sense? Right. It's um, yeah. So, I get I get what you're saying. But as far as I mean, like general characters like like that, like mm-hmm. Lee or mm-hmm. or Bedford Forrest or whoever, um, those are like main figures. So as far as like yeah. like in school learning about it, those will come up. Yeah. You're going to learn about oh, it. even okay. in high school history, yeah. um, just in covering the Civil War in general you wouldn't be able to cover it without talking about any of those people. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, at at the same time, there's a lot of other, you know, pieces of that story. That's just sticking with civil war that have been pushed to the wayside Mm -hmm. that are both good and bad things because it's such a dense topic. Mm -hmm. And and a lot of topics in history are that way. Mm -hmm. Um, that's kind of, I don't know if I'm a, a glutton for punishment, but I always kind of lean toward the topics that are more gray area and hard to interpret. Uh, my thesis is based around World War One. Okay. When I talk about the origins of World War One, uh, there are literally volumes written about mm-hmm. <laughs> about that, and mm-hmm. you know how did it start, and who's to blame, and why are we, you know, why did this happen? It's just there's so much to it you couldn't possibly cover it right. in, you know, even I have an entire bookshelf full of books that don't cover every aspect of it. And that was the issue with our civil war museum there in Nebraska city. When Mm -hmm. we redid that, um, in 2019, uh, November, 2019, we gutted the entire gallery, uh, started from scratch did a complete renovation and, uh, trying to cover 
the entire story of the Civil War was not possible. Uh, the National Civil War Museum doesn't cover the entire story because, mm -hmm. again, there's like uh, like Shelby Foote, uh, you know, wrote the three volume set of Shelby Foote's history of the Civil War. That is two and a half million words. It's th mm. like this thick. I'm mm. holding up my hand like people can see it, but <laughs> it's it's like eight to ten inches thick. Uh, three volumes, and he misses some things. <laughs> like it's oh, I'm and sure. he's he's yeah. in depth. Um, so we had to pick and choose specifically either um, like overarching ideas or summaries of the Civil War or things specific to Nebraska or the region or or whatever. Um, and so it just I think inevitably. In the whole scope of history, things are going to get forgotten mm -hmm. by, you know, by the general, I say general public, but most things in history are forgotten except for those people that really dive into the little minute right. topics and, right. and whatever. Um, so it inevitably happens on any topic. It's just. I think it's, I think it's sad that those things get forgotten because they should influence our behavior today, mm -hmm. you know, and how we go forward. And the last point that I want to make on that is, um, you know, you talked about, you're talking about some of these historical figures and you're like, okay, you know, and this guy owned slaves and, you know, this is, these are bad things. Yes, they are in today's context, a hundred percent. But in yesterday's context back then, w you know, we, you have to, I, I feel like you have to try to put yourself in those people's mind frames, which is really hard for people to do, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but to put your, put yourself in those shoes to where it was like, it was just a regular thing and right or wrong at the time, there was a lot of people that did really well with it, including the slaves that were, that were, were part of it and, and everything went really good for everybody. Not always, but then we look at it today and we go, people cannot treat people that way. And I a hundred percent agree with that, but things just they just change over the years. You know what I mean? So to try to judge someone with today's state of mind, as opposed to that day's you state of mind. can't virtue signal from 50 years, yeah. you know, in yeah. the future. Like that's, <laughs> that's a ridiculous. Stuff changes. There's, like I, I yeah. right or wrong, we could go, we could talk about a hundred things here, but um, I, I kind of compare it to uh, thinking about something like LGBTQ stuff. Like today we have an acceptance and an understanding of that. Mm-hmm. It wasn't very long ago that people were like, no, 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 that and you all does got not in work. One group too. Yeah, you know? and and yeah. you you know these people should be shunned and these kinds mm -hmm. of things. And today, and and but if you rewind back to then, you can kind of see where everyone's kind of mindset was. It was it was something strange. It was something new. It was something they didn't get. It was something they thought was yeah. Yeah. religiously wrong or whatever. And then today, yeah. a lot of folks look at it and they're like, no, no, I get it. Okay, so let's just give – the criminals aren't – we're not going to give grace, but let's just give a lot of people grace that they didn't get it. They were in that time. You also have you to know? understand that. Otherwise, history will repeat itself or – how did you say that? Rhyme? Or rhyme. Or that's rhymes. the point. That, and that's exactly the point. You're exactly right. That's yeah. what we – we have to understand that so that we don't so redo it. One mm -hmm. that really irked me uh, and tied into the Super Bowl that just happened. Not the Super Bowl here with the museum, but the actual sporting event. Um, I'm, I'm listening to some pregame hype, you know, on Friday and Saturday, listening to some talk radio. And just out of nowhere, they just uh, send this snippet. First time it's going to be an African-American quarterback versus an African-American quarterback. I heard that too. Like, and I was well, like, what why? Is that, why does that matter? And also, I, I don't want to get into that side of it. But anyway, back in Super Bowl twenty two for the Redskins, all this stuff mm -hmm. is true. Doug Williams, a solidified African-American, won the Super Bowl. Like, this was Super Bowl 57. What year was it, you say? Uh, it was Super Bowl 22. So Super Bowl 22. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Yep. And yep. my mom's a big Redskins yep. fan. She's from the D.C. area. Yep. So, like, uh, we had, uh, like, pictures and stuff like that, you know, memorabilia of this guy. And the way it was portrayed, it was like this had never happened before. Mm. And my brother-in-law, who's big into sports, you know, fantasy football, that – he was telling people at the party, yeah, it was the first time an African-American quarterback played in the Super Bowl. I'm like, no, Doug Williams won the Super Bowl back in the 80s. Yeah, because that's what I thought. I thought, there, how can that be? And, and he goes, who's that? I go, Doug Williams for the Redskins. And he goes, nah. I pulled up so the that's a great example. Pulled up the Wikipedia page and showed me. He goes, who the hell is this? I go, yeah, that's right. And instead of our society celebrating Doug Williams and understanding who he is, we just try to pretend that it doesn't matter and let's 
throw this narrative out there that mm-hmm. we're still against each other, we're still pending it, and we're not mm-hmm. we're not evolving as a country, as a society. That's the stuff I don't like. Like, I understand Doug Williams is the guy, and he won mm-hmm. the Super Bowl, and if you need to put a label on him, yes, he was African-American. But I just mm-hmm. like to call him an athlete. Sure, like, just, yeah. I wish guy we could just football. leave it there. Yeah. Yep. Patrick mm-hmm. Mahomes is a phenomenal football player, baseball player, and he's so good, mm-hmm. he won the Super Bowl for the second time in four years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where I really wish we could be. Yeah, and we, kind of what we were talking about earlier, most of us, as far as the people, don't know that because, mm-hmm. one, it's not being taught, and, two, it hasn't been celebrated in any big way. Right. So everyone's just like, oh, yeah, okay, well, they must be right. This is mm-hmm. this is the first two First two black quarterbacks, you know, First and that's liberal. and that's what I'm talking about with kind of the, some of the things that you're talking about is if that stuff gets lost in the history books, then people are like they're not learn they're not learning from it. They're just like getting fed something. It feel it feels like. Mm-hmm. Well, and there's to add to your um, discussion earlier, we were talking about the kind of saying people are a product of their time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. kind of thing is a, is a general uh, like go to argument of like, well, they're a product of their time. We have to separate them from that. Mm-hmm. Um, but the the reality is that even at the time, it was not okay. Like not looking back at it going mm-hmm. like, you know, well, it's not okay from, from 2023. Right, right. Yeah. But at the time, it was already believed to be not okay by sure. most people not involved yeah. in the system. Like, uh, I think back to uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, who was a French writer, wrote Democracy in America, came here and he traveled all over the U.S. and wrote a giant, thick book that I had to read in political science class in college. <laughs> <All right. laughs> like, there's, there's a lot of good points in there and he's also really windy. <clears throat> like, he just, he liked to write. Um, he was appalled. Uh, that was the 1780s. Um, and most, like, we would have people travel, you know, from... Europe or Australia or Canada or whatever, it's like we were already way behind times mm-hmm. as far as like, so, but when you say like 1860s, 1850s, I mean, you know, what, 1804, I think, 1804, 1805 is when slavery is banned in the U.S. as far as the import of enslaved peoples to the U.S. So you're talking like 60 years later and it's still, we gotcha. yeah. yeah. And yeah. so the, that was one, one thing we had to really tackle when we did that renovation at civil war is we sat down uh, in our board meetings and kind of went back and, and forth on this. And there were a few of us in that meeting that were like, like, this is the hill we're going to die on and we're making this decision. And we took a institutional stance, which we agreed was okay to do. Um, and the very first panel in that museum is what is the cause of the civil war because it's still debated, but it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, and our institutional stance is here's all the evidence we have. Here's all the documentation. Here's our sources. It was slavery. It wasn't state's rights. It was slavery. Mm -hmm. And that's the argument still. Um, the best example I have is the U S citizenship test. It's 100 questions. There is one correct answer and only one for 99 of those questions. Uh, Any deviation from that answer is wrong. Mm -hmm. There is one question that has two correct answers, and it's what was the cause of the American Civil War? Really? And it's uh, states' rights or slavery. Mm. But the argument is, like, if somebody says, well, it was states' rights, it's like, okay, states' rights to what? Because that's the only thing you're trying to protect. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. And so in that first panel, it literally says, like, causes of the Civil War. And it's just the very first sentence is slavery was the primary cause of the Civil War. And the next panel is here's all of our evidence why. And it's, excuse me, three or four uh, snippets from the Articles of Secession from Southern states where they it's bolded in there. This uh-huh. is like, here's the reasons why we seceded. And it's like slavery, slavery, slavery. I mean, yeah. it's it, it's just one of those arguments that gets put forth every time when it's brought up Mm -hmm. but it's like it it was their way of skirting the topic back then and it's become a way of skirting the topic no it's a way of like not admitting that that's what they actually were Mm -hmm. were fighting for you know like it's it's okay to say states rights but when you're saying like again it's your right to what 
Like yeah. what it, what is it? Um, and I, there's economic arguments to be made. There's sociopolitical arguments to be made, but sure. But it, it all, it all comes that. down to that main topic of yeah. like, nope, this is what you wanted to protect. Mm -hmm. There is no other argument that can be made. So, okay. Now I, I want to stay on that parallel and you're talking about history rhyming. I think that's a, it doesn't repeat, but it will rhyme. I think we're rhyming again because if you take that a step further, the slavery issue, we're talking about cheap labor, a cheap labor workforce, right? Free labor workforce. I, I was just free. thinking that yeah. free. Well, well, okay, yes. Did they get, okay, yeah. Okay, but the point I'm making is okay. uh, I'm holding an iPhone here. And if you want to call those people that make our iPhones overseas free, go ahead. I mean, you're about a lot of... Oh, no, no. You That's, know what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, the, the, we're still, like, we love all these conveniences, our modern-day conveniences, but we're still willing to mm -hmm. turn or bat an eye uh, over that. And I think we just kind of moved it. We just we just said, okay, we're not going to do that here in the States. And also, a cotton gin was created, made it kind of convenient. Um, but we're okay with it as far as it being over in China or over in India. Mm -hmm. We'll take it then. So, like... And once and back to Ben's point, if we don't keep this narrative, this history top of mind and keep it in front of people like, no, this is what really happened. Stop it. Doug Williams is a guy. He won a Super Bowl. We're just going to keep well, going down the same path. And there's an argument to be made as well for oh, let's have it. the fact that, <laughs> I mean, this is, a, this is a whole nother, another thing. This could be like three podcasts in its own, but, um, and this is just my, my personal feelings on this, but, um, <clears throat> Slavery didn't go away in this country. Okay. Uh, it was entirely free labor. That's what I was just mm -hmm. saying. Like over in China, yeah, they're paid, but it's eh. barely, barely eh. anything. It might as well be free. Mm -hmm. um, but slavery didn't go away here. It became the uh, prison industrial complex. We created private prisons and we have filled them with people hmm. that then do work for they us. Still we work, still yeah. have slavery in this country. Yeah. Um, and that it, that's just... That it's not. I mean, it's my opinion, but it's also something that can be backed up by just looking at facts yeah. of of prisons in the U.S. and how many people are incarcerated here and for yeah. what. And it's yeah. just it's ridiculous. And yeah. so, yeah, that's we need to decriminalize a lot of things. And <laughs> no, I like <laughs> that because they're not doing crazy. any good. Yeah, th th these people that especially you know like white collar crimes or whatever, uh, or just low, not even misdemeanor type stuff like. What the heck are we filling mm -hmm. up these prisons for? And we are sending you people know. to prison for, you know, 15, 20 yeah. years for half a gram of weed mm -hmm. or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. And now cares, it's legalized you know? in most states anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's just, I think it's crazy. Gotta, so it didn't really go away. It's just. That sounds like something we could dive into next time. <laughs> Man, I think, I mean, I've been thinking for about the last 20 minutes since we've been talking about this stuff that yeah. like if, if Dean's willing to. Yeah. I think we should plan a couple of episodes on like a specific topic in history mm -hmm. and really get into it because he's got the actual facts and research mm -hmm. and those kinds of things which have formed a lot of his own opinions and, and facts. Mm -hmm. And then we've got kind of the outsider looking in saying, right. well, hey, what about this? What about that? And I think it'd just be a super interesting conversation. Yeah, what I learned or what I remember from high school on said topic. Yeah, and then, yeah. <laughs> And then what I saw on my Instagram scroll. Right. Yeah, to back yeah. It up. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. On, on my Facebook group page. Like, yes. Oh, no. No, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. What, that's how I make my mind up. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, Ben, what'd you bring into uh, the uh, studio here? Uh, yeah, man. So, I mean, I guess we're pretty well done with that, huh? Like, yeah. we're, yeah, because we, we could, again, we, I know. we, we could yeah. be going we on. We covered for, a lot. Yeah. I know. I, and I, I just, I could keep talking for like hours. Yeah. yeah. I'm so yeah. curious. I can get off on tangents pretty easy. No, it's good. <laughs> so. Um, so, first of all, Dean, thank you for coming. Um, this has been pretty fun. Just, I feel like it's, I don't know. I, I feel when I'm, it, the point that I'm at right now, I feel really like unsatisfied. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I want to keep digging Chatting. into things yeah, yeah. so yeah. hopefully we'll get to do a little bit more of that but uh, we only have so much time so yeah um to get into a, a couple of other things here um real quick to give a couple of shout outs to some people that we work with number one uh this company that we know here in nebraska is called handlebend uh have you ever heard of handlebend mm -mm. all right so handlebend's out of o'neill nebraska mm -hmm. um and these folks make some really cool copper products. So let me show you what we've got going on right here, first of all. 
what? <laughs> <laughs> a little speakeasy talking about historical spaces and yep, places. Yep, right. Historical space right there. So uh, down within the center of our table here, we've got um, a couple of products. But first of all, these cups made by Handle Bend. So you go ahead and take one of those for a second. Um, handmade copper products, super cool stuff. A really neat gift for anybody. I mean, you can imagine like you receive one of those. That's pretty badass. So I thought it was a shell casing when you first. Oh, we <laughs> came into it. You know, the, that's funny. The rim, the and like that hand welded rim that's at the bottom. It, like, World it looks, War One, right there. Yeah, yeah. The right. history guy. It looks like a, about a one twenty mil casing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, so those those boys have uh, gifted gifted us a couple of things for our guests. So this package that you see right here, this is for you. Oh, awesome. Uh, within wow. that package is a is a sim- similar cups that you have in your hand there, except full size. Those ones are made for our little speakeasy. Huh. Um, so you'll that take that awesome. with you. Thank you. Yeah, as you can see, the packaging is super cool. Like these guys don't um, leave any stone unturned. They make a really cool product, and then their packaging is almost cooler than the product itself. <laughs> right. Uh, it comes with, it's got its own pry bar on there. Yeah, like, you're going yeah, to have to like chisel that, that thing, open. Yeah, you're obviously going to have a hard time opening that thing up, so they don't want you to have to find your own tools, a tool strapped to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've done that as a joke gifts to friends of mine before. I yeah. Give them a, like a nice bottle of whiskey, but make a, a crate out of it that's all like screwed together, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's like you're going to yeah. need like five different types of screwdrivers because I use like Phillips and right. Square and Torx. And, yeah, anyway. Right. But this one, yeah, no, that's cool. It's like old old style wooden crate with the pry yeah. bar and everything. That's cool. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, and, you know, from a history standpoint, I mean, O'Neill, we've talked about yeah. O'Neill a few times. Yeah, that's the Irish capital of Nebraska. But it is. That's yeah. up for debate. Talk to people from Greeley. They're like, no, mm-hmm. no, 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 no. We're the really? Irish capital. Of, I, w- I want them to do like a St. Patrick's Day, like, I don't know, shamrock off competition yeah. <laughs> or something, you like, know? Like, who's more? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we don't want to start too much. You know, there was kind of a, a thing in the 70s and 80s in Ireland where they <laughs> oh they, yeah. they tried that and it Once got a little again, messy. Yeah. <laughs> Once <Yeah>. again. <laughs> It's like a, an IRA versus the... Yeah, we don't yeah. need that. Anyway. Yeah. A civil yeah. war between yeah. the Nebraska Irish. We have the, Gosh. The backyard. Yeah. We have the loyalists and the and the unionists you yeah. know, from Greeley and O'Neill. So. Well, I was hoping we'd just keep it at drinking Guinness and like a little beer fest competition. Right. Or yeah. Yeah. That's all I was Yeah, that'd be more fun. <laughs> One of our board members of the Civil War Museum, I have to give a shout out there in Nebraska City, is from Greeley. Oh, wow. See? And it has like many, many like t-shirts that he wears. I have like Greeley Irish Festival or whatever. So oh, he gosh. would argue you against O'Neill. <laughs> See, there I, you go. I knew I knew all yeah. about it, but mm-hmm. you know I'm from the O'Neill area, so I'm pro O'Neill. Mm-hmm. And but I know Greeley's out there. So. <laughs> you know they <laughs> exist, even though you don't believe in them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. Gee whiz. <laughs> They're gonna come find you and hunt them down. I'm not going that way. Yeah. <laughs> so what's cool about these guys too is like you know again the topic that we have today from a history standpoint, these guys are just bringing back like old school stuff. You know, it's just, it's, it's cool products. It's cool customer service. It's cool people. So you've got that, that's for you to take home. And then what we like to do, if you want to participate is we like to have a little final drink with everybody. A little toast. Yeah. Sure. So we've got a couple of drinks here from our buddies at Cooper's Chase. Oh yeah. Vodka and bourbons. Little distillery out of West Point, Nebraska. And this is all made from the grains right down the street. Most of it out of the Beamer elevator. Our buddy huh. Doug Trainer, mm-hmm. uh, mm-hmm. and yeah, I mean, this is what he does. Like he goes home from work, and then he goes to work distilling his vodka and bourbon, and he's just phenomenal. I didn't know that's where that was from. Mm-hmm. It was a few years ago, um, working with the Chamber of Commerce there in Nebraska City, we have the Nebraska uh, Bloody Mary State Championships. Yes, okay. I saw the T-shirts. And Ch- uh, Cooper's Chase sponsored that mm-hmm. a few years ago, nice. and I'm pretty sure in our fridge, uh, our freezer out in my workshop at home. I've got like four bottles of that. Oh, well, bring <laughs> them on were, up. Because I stopped in the chamber <laughs> office one time after that that year where they sponsored, and the chamber ladies were like, "Here, here's a bag of vodka. Take that home." Because no. we have like okay. all these bottles. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's that's great stuff. I yeah, didn't realize that's cool. where that came from. Yeah, so yeah. I should have read the bottle. <laughs> yeah, that's a when we've kind of end up doing that. We have a lot of Nebraska entrepreneurs and mm-hmm. business owners and mm-hmm. creators. It's been a lot of fun last year. I had a uh, message sent to us on Instagram yesterday from someone who kind I, I they knew Doug in one way or another yeah and they had listened to the podcast They're like man I love the podcast 
I was just talking to Doug. I want to come in and talk to you guys. And he's, oh, such, really? he's such a great dude and <laughs> they've got good products. And those, um, if you start listening to the podcast, mm-hmm. those episodes with Doug are pretty good. So I have yeah. to check in on cool. those ones. Yep. Yeah. So what do we got here? I'm, I'm doing vodka. Which one do you guys want? I'll do the bourbon. How about mm. you, bud? Dean? I think I'm probably going to do bourbon as well. All bourbon. Right. I think I'm going to pass. I got to do school pickup. Oh, what? Jeez. So you're going White Claw? Yeah, I'm going to do White Claw. <laughs> yeah. a shot of White Claw. Okay, I'll do it. I don't shot. normally do the vodka. I, I, I was shocked when you said <coughs> vodka. I just want to mix it up a little bit. Okay. I do like the bourbon, though. It's dang good. Yeah, pretty smooth. Pretty we need to get smooth. another bourbon. Hmm. Getting low. Uh, Doug actually texted me a couple of weeks ago, but before, right before we went on, and mm-hmm. I shot him a picture because we I was getting mm-hmm. the speakeasy ready. I said, if we could use the refill, he goes, I'll be right down. <laughs> so, yeah, we just got to get him back down here. He, I'm sure he'd be down for another episode, too. Well, oh, yeah. thanks for coming in. So it sounds yeah, like thanks for having me. we're this having is... you back like two or three more times. So. Sure. <laughs> we're definitely going to do that. <laughs> give, me a, give me a heads up on the topic, and I'll, yep. I'll do my research. <laughs> right. <laughs> all right. Quick drink here. Let's see. It's probably all in your brain, though. I mean, you sound like you can there just. We go. You have so many facts. Man, you just like it's, that's store the, uh, everything like files in your brain or what? Like, it's the, the mixture of being a. Uh, historian with uh, ADHD though is that mm. you know it kind of is just a cloud of different <laughs> things going on up there so kind of a a jack of all trades and a master of none so anyway no it I'm, sounds sounds awesome Dean does so yeah. much like I said I think he's in charge of eight local area uh, museums so mm. pretty try awesome to, try to keep awesome. all those plates spinning at once so yeah yep. busy well, it's been fun Dean man we appreciate mm-hmm. you coming up making the trip hanging out a little bit yeah, thanks for having me. This has been a blast. Hopefully mm-hmm. you're cool with uh, doing a couple more down the road here. Absolutely. Awesome. Perfect. All right, cool. Well, we're going to close it out. You guys need anything else? Yeah. No. Nope. All right. Good. All right, we'll see you guys.